Good morning. morning. So, last week before the spring break, week seven, this is the plan for the week. We're trying to catch up. We were supposed to be at around chapter eight. We'll try our best to get closer for sure. We'll go through the analysis of chapters three to five, and then we'll, we'll start with six, maybe seven today. Eventually, we will catch up. On Wednesday, I will continue and complete my analysis of The Princess by Harriet Rubin. And I was thinking before the class, maybe I should also add point two for Wednesday because it's about time we discuss the final project and you start thinking about your choice of a book, a topic for the final project. And there is a whole page with tips, suggestions, a template and I want to illustrate at least some of the points in that page, so I'll add it later. On Friday, we're watching a nice movie uh, from 1999, a talented Mr. Ripley, based on a series of, on a character from a series of successful novels. In order to introduce my reading of chapters three to five, I want first to illustrate and summarize what we find there that is relevant for us and that is compatible with our initial presentation of what being Machiavellian really entails, which is more than just uh, being dishonest. One of the themes in this group of chapters, one of the recurring ideas is that whatever you do in the political games, whatever, whichever crisis you're faced with, as a prince, you have to rely both on influence and force. Perhaps not at the same time. There are times when you rely almost exclusively on force during the time of an invasion, during the time of a coup d'etat, of a change of a radical, dramatic, quick change of governments, then there will be more peaceful times when you rely almost exclusively on influence, but they work together, both the indirect and the direct forms of power are necessary for control to be gained and retained. Another concept that is present in these chapters, but has to be unpacked from the examples and Machiavelli's consideration, you don't find Machiavelli being explicit about it, is that the context is key to the understanding of what political power and control are about. And when we talk about context, that would be semantically limited unless we thought of the context in terms of a natural ecosystem. That is to say, not something fixed, but something that has a lot of ongoing processes and activities that influence each other. And a place where you find different kinds of players, the citizens, and when Machiavelli refers to the people, the subject, the citizens, keep in mind that there is always two groups, two profiles that he has in mind. On one hand, in some passages, the people are in fact the elites, the professionals, the entrepreneurs, those that are the engine of the economy in a bigger way. However, the people can also be the masses because the masses may not have power individually because they're not rich, socially because they don't have enough influence, politically because they don't have any political rights really. They don't vote, they don't get voted, not even in a primitive rudimentary kind of republic as the Republic of Florence in which Machiavelli lived part of his adult life was. However, since they're so numerous, their number makes them 
influential and not to be ignored because after all, it is also a game of numbers during this period. When ambassadors, spies, diplomats send their reports about a, a, in another state back to Florence and about their resources, they always include the number of male citizens in the entirety of the state. Because the assumption is that almost any of those male members of the state, anyone from the late teenage year into their 40s or 50s, can easily be turned into a soldier. You just have to give them a weapon, minimal training, and they can mount an opposition. And I'm sorry if, if this triggers memories of the events that we see every day on TV or on the screens of our phones, okay? So the context is key to the understanding of what works, what doesn't work. And for example, Machiavelli will multiple times in these chapters tell the prince, if that's the situation, go live in there. To ensure control of the newly acquired state, go live there. Which means insert yourself in the context. Because if you insert yourself in the context, then the context will be affected by your presence in a positive way. The other uh, theme that appears here and then will be treated more systematically towards the end of the book of the prince is the dichotomy or the opposition between what Machiavelli calls virtue and what Machiavelli calls fortune, which are keywords in the culture of the Renaissance, but they need to be unpacked and understood correctly. So virtue for Machiavelli means nothing as it had meant in previous cultures, namely, especially the medieval culture. That is to say, Virtue is not good behavior, honest behavior, positive values. Virtue for Machiavelli means the skills you can deploy in a context to ensure that the outcome you're looking for, you're seeking, is obtained. So virtue is defined by the context. So depending on the context, eliminating your enemies physically can be virtue. Okay? In other contexts, being honest, being a good father to your citizens may be virtue. In terms of a universal definition of virtue, there isn't one according to Machiavelli. So virtue changes what constitutes virtue. Changes depending on the context, and the context is an ecosystem, so it changes also depending on the time because this context is not fixed, is never fixed. It may maintain certain features for one generation, two, three generations, but eventually, it's only a matter of time, eventually things will change and then you have to adapt or perish. What is fortune? Fortune is the external circumstances that you have to fight for Fight, fight against or take into consideration in order to be successful. That is to say, in Renaissance terms, fortune is whatever you don't control directly. Whatever you have to fight in order to control with the understanding, with the assumption, the underlying assumption that it's a big step compared to the Middle Ages, the idea that uh, everyone is responsible for their own destiny. However, there is also the notion that no one can have absolute control over their destiny because there is this element of fortune, because there are circumstances that are not decided by the individual. And the easiest examples would be where you're born in society, where you're, whether you're born rich or poor, born into 
an aristocratic family, an influential family, a family with political connections or not, and also whether or not you're born into a context where the skills that nature gave you are in demand or not. And we'll see the radically innovative statements by Machiavelli in chapter 5 that for Moses, the part, the, 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 one, one of the uh, leading figures in the Bible, for Moses it was necessary to find the Jews enslaved in Egypt for his leadership to be in demand. Meaning that if Moses or someone else with those skills, with the same set of skills, had been born to a different kind of historical context, then he would never have become the leader of the Jewish people. So there is a constant struggle between men's skills and the external circumstances. And there are times when you can prevail and times when fortune will prevail upon you, okay? So it's not a positive, a completely positive view of life uh, such as the one that you find from the Enlightenment on. There's conviction that if you apply yourself, you'll find a way to control everything in society, which is the driving idea in the politics and the political planning of the next 150 years after the French Revolution and up until World War II. The balance is much closer between the skills of uh, men who can be leaders and the power that circumstances have upon them, the things, the number of things they cannot control, okay? So in a way, it, it's a positive view of life compared to the Middle Ages because the Middle Ages uh, express a religious culture where in order to be really successful you have to divest yourself of any pretense of power and control and abandon yourself to providence, to God, right? To those positive forces outside of you. In Renaissance culture, the man is the protagonist, can control nature, can control society, but that control is very thin and has to be renewed time after time. So there might be a time when you eventually fail because you don't have enough control, and that is the message that will come, up, come out of chapter seven where Machiavelli will propose the ideal prince and then ex explain at the end uh, that he was a complete failure within a context that had changed dramatically. He couldn't react, he couldn't adapt. His, his own skills were not good for those circumstances and therefore fortune prevailed upon him. The language, oh, by the way, and virtue is something that is possessed by virtually any individual. However, keep in mind that in Machiavelli's view, only within every, any generation, within any society or community, there are only a few individuals who have the right kind of skills to become leaders, okay? So it, it's not a populist view of leadership. You can be whatever you want if you work on it. No, there are only a few who are given that opportunity, and even among them, some may not realize their potential, may not develop their talents in such a way that they'll become successful. What's striking in several of the passages is the matter of fact language with which Machiavelli talks about the elimination of the enemies. And you'll see time and time again that Machiavelli will just say, well, in this kind of context, it is sufficient to eliminate your enemies without feeling the need at all for some kind of moral justification without trying to say, for example, as the books on reason, on, on reason of state later might say, it is necessary because uh, for, to ensure the welfare of your citizens, the welfare of your state, you have to proceed in such a way. So I know it's wrong, but it's 
in a way morally, ethically, politically justified. Nothing. He goes straight to the point. If those are the circumstances that I described, then elimination of your enemies, elimination of the previous leaders is a necessity. That's plain and simple. And it doesn't matter what the psychological profile of the leader is. They might be inclined to that kind of evil behavior. They might not be inclined at all. That's, that needs to be done. Okay? The other theme that is uh, uh, present in these chapters is the opposition between change. Change needs to, be, uh, to occur for new states to be established or new leadership to come into power. But whenever that happens in a society, you have to consider that the citizens are creatures of habits. And therefore, whenever you upset the balance of a society, whenever you introduce changes that impact in one way or the other on the habits of the citizens, you're going to face some resistance. And this idea that most people are creatures of habits, to a degree even the leaders, comes to Machiavelli from Greek or Roman culture, particularly from Aristotle and his book on ethics, where Aristotle insists a lot on the, the idea that the mind is shaped by behaviors. So you are what you do regularly. You become what you do on a regular basis. Whatever you do and whether you do that intentionally as a choice, as a result of your desires, or unintentionally because you have to, because you are forced to, it doesn't matter. Whatever you do reshapes your mind. And therefore, if you introduce a change in society, people will resist that change no matter whether it's good or bad, simply because they want to continue doing whatever you're doing. To a degree, this is true of the leaders, because Machiavelli will say later on in this book that even leaders tend to repeat whatever made them successful, ignoring the laws of context and ecosystem, that is to say the fact that it doesn't matter if a certain political approach, the use of the military, or the use of diplomacy, the use of cruelty, or the use of uh, nicer approaches to the use of authority, made you successful in the past. This, it doesn't matter how many times you are successful by repeating that uh, strategy. When the context changes and demands a different kind of approach, you will fail for that very reason. As, as, as a more personal example, I mentioned earlier uh, last week or the week before the idea that you should be reading biographies of people who have become billionaires to find there the recipe for your own success when the circumstances, the context, may have changed so much that even if those memoirs are sincere and honest about how they achieve success, because sometimes there are some dirty tricks that are left out, even if they're honest and sincere, you cannot apply the same kind of strategy to a changed market, to a changed work environment, to a changed economy, because even if you do it correctly, the same result will not be produced. I've created a page where I listed some of the concepts and a few quotes so that you can, we can proceed more uh, quickly. So I've taken up chapter three from the very beginning and the two points are worded in such a way that I want to make you understand that no matter how big, large the power of a leader is, even the power of a leader operates within a context that sets some boundaries, that limits the exercise of power. So for example, as a leader, you have to work against or with 
the natural mindset of the citizens. And now, in this case, the citizens Machiavelli is talking about are the merchants, the entrepreneurs, the rich, the wealthy who are responsible for the growth of the economy, for the investments, who will commit or not commit their resources to the growth of the local economy. They want to be better off, right? They want to be richer, they want to be wealthier. You have to keep that in mind for two reasons. One is that if you impact negatively on their goal of being better off, you'll find resistance. Resistance means that your influence will not support your authority, and then faced with the res this resistance, you might have to use force, but then if you use force, you lose influence, and you lose resources because force is costly. And the other way this is relevant is that if the citizens are not fully committed to the growth of the local economy, then you will not have, as a prince, as a leader, the sufficient resources to maintain an army, to pay for mercenary soldiers, and military infrastructures, etc. Then, if you're talking about a period of change, replacing a government with another one, installing yourself as a leader in a place that was under different leadership, you have to face certain limitations, right? For example, the fact that if you apply force, through the use of soldiers, you will produce a series of injuries, Machiavelli calls them, you will offend, that's another verb like by Machiavelli, you will offend the uh, citizens. And in this case, the limitations of control are such that whenever you deploy force, you cannot have complete control over your army, over your military, over your soldiers. That is to say, it's unavoidable that at least some of the troops involved in a war operation will commit acts of violence, will be responsible for an abusive use of force, and, for example, civilians will perish even if they're not the target of that operation. And, of course, we see plenty of that with the invasion of Ukraine. Okay, so keep in mind this Renaissance view of man and power by Machiavelli, the idea that, yes, you have to pursue control, but that control can never be absolute that it's impossible to have complete control. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the, the generals and the politicians of today instead do believe that it, it should be possible to have uh, a war where the loss of civilians and damages to society in general can be limited to almost zero, right? That, that was the, the assumption uh, the prejudicial assumption for the war in Iraq, for the war in Afghanistan, and now for the war in Ukraine, right? And then, of course, because of this lack of control over your uh, invading forces, you have a loss of influence among those that suffered. Again, offended is the term used by Machiavelli for anyone who suffered loss of lives, members of their family, and loss of property. Those are the two categories that Machiavelli has in mind when he talks about offending, right? You lose money or you lose members of your family, members of your community, and therefore you, you uh, suffer the consequences. Then those will not respect your authority, will lose respect for your authority. So influence is not sufficient. Either you commit resources to restoring your influence or you have to resort only to the use of force. Then within this community that you have invaded, you might have supporters, people who want to benefit from your leadership, right? Who support you because they want something in exchange for that. But exactly because they are your strongest supporters, you can only rely on influence. But then Machiavelli will tell you, you can never rely just on influence or just on force. 
So whenever he sees a clear imbalance between these two, although you know that force doesn't need to be used at all times, force, it's something you need to have, and then you use it to generate deterrence, right? Simply because you have force, people will be intimidated into compliance. But in the case of your supporters, you are limited, right? Then you cannot apply force, otherwise they will not support you, but you have to rely on influence, and influence has a limit because according to Machiavelli, people are fickle, people are temperamental, they change their minds easily, and if they change their mind, if they don't love you anymore, they don't like you anymore, then how can you continue to have control, okay? Another example of the synergy between force and influence is this idea by Machiavelli in chapter three, even a strong army needs the favor, he calls it the favor of the locals during an invasion, right? And again, it's easy to compare this to the current invasion of Ukraine, where the Ukrainian army is not doing so well, right? But then you have the resistance mounted by volunteers in the local population, and the resistance of the population even when they're unarmed. And that's what is slowing down the advance of the Russian army. So militarily, clearly, they should be in control based on the superiority, the numerical superiority, the superiority of the technology, of the weapons they have. In fact, lacking this element of favor, that force is not enough. It would be enough to win a battle, but it's not enough to win the war. At least it doesn't look that way. And look what happens in this case to the uh, balance between influence and force. Machiavelli will tell you, whenever territories lost to rebellions are regained, and he makes the example of the Duchy of Milan, they are lost a second time with greater difficulty. Why? Because in this case, you can be forceful the second time. And why is that? Again, this is implied by Machiavelli, but if you reread this passage with this idea in mind, you will see it. Because the second time, force is seen by everybody as necessary and justified, and therefore your image, your influence, your authority, is not affected as much. Still, it's interesting to notice that Machiavelli will introduce an exception to the exception and say, well, still the Duke of Milan lost it, lost the duty the first time and the second time, which is a confirmation that there are no universal laws. That no matter what you say, if the circumstances change even a little bit in this context, the virtue of the leader changes or any other circumstance change changes, then uh, things will not go as planned or as predicted. Another example of influence can be seen when Machiavelli then in the following page talks about adding to your state as a leader other territories that have commonalities of culture and language, and that is always easier because you can rely on influence, right? because there is something in common that makes them more inclined to accept you as an invader. And again, it's plain and simple to see what the, the fewer problems that Russia had invading Donbas and those republics, those regions of Ukraine to the east where the majority of the local population is Russians. And in fact, those Russians, apparently also uh, suffered some discriminations and violence under the Ukrainian regime, and therefore they were willing to accept the Russian invader and have, and they have the favor of the locals that Machiavelli mentions earlier. Still, in reference to the ecosystem and the various forces that are active, the various processes that affect control, if those people are not used to living in freedom, then it's easier to conquer them and to have control. Again, it's the, the, the idea of habits, that people are creature of, creatures of habits, even when 
the situation is negatively affecting them, right? They have no freedom, so they shouldn't be so happy. But since they have lived that way for such a long time, then this element of time has to be considered, okay? The same way that in terms of psychology, you see people suffering abuse, and yet they remain in an abusive situation because they become used to being abused for a very long time. And from the outside, you simply say, how could they not change, not rebel, etc., etc.? But that's what happens. So it's an element of human nature in this humanist view of society. And then you find the first in the number of references. Well, in that situation, it is sufficient to eliminate the previous leaders. Again, Machiavelli doesn't say why. He doesn't say, oh, blood. Uh, because really, he's talking about murder as a political weapon, right? Elimination means one of two things, putting them in jail or killing them. But in some instances, Machiavelli will be more explicit and will say that killing is, is sure, more, more certain, right? Safer, because there is no chance that they'll come back to um, seek revenge against you. But again, what is radical what is completely innovative compared to the entire tradition of political thinking and political philosophy is that Machiavelli doesn't feel necessary, doesn't feel obliged to provide any kind of moral discussion of this, any kind of justification. Because he's looking at things in this effectual way, in this pragmatic and factual way. The context requires this kind of strategy for the outcome to be ensured with a certain degree of certainty. So this is what you have to do, whether you're a murderous leader or an honest leader, right? And then he says that it's important in this case that the new and the old territories become a single body. And this is one of many references to biology, to the biological ideas of the time by Machiavelli, this idea that if you take society as a whole, society often works like a single individual in terms of psychological dispositions, psychological reactions, which is something that will be explored in the 20th century with all the books about the masses, right? And what happens when a large group of people enters into panic or into a frenzy, right? And, and the more basic animalistic reactions that a large group may have in a certain kind of situation. Of course, the opposite is also true, right? If there is a difference in language, customs, and orders, then control is more difficult because influence doesn't come natural. You have to rely more on force than on influence, although eventually you have a period where You've gained your control, you put away the use of force, you keep your force, but don't deploy it, and then you can rely on influence. Then you can establish new boundaries and start establishing new habits, okay? So in, in Machiavelli's view, there is hope for Italy, even though Italy is fragmented, and therefore people are habituated to different kinds of governments. They might be subject subjected to uh, the establishment of new habits by a powerful enough leaders. In that case, where there is uh, more difficulty in establishing control, what are the remedies? The leader should go there in person. And why? Because this way, any issue, any disorder, any critical issue is identified and remedied in a timely fashion. And this is where Machiavelli borrows not from biology, but from medicine, the idea that the treatment has to be applied at the right time, the idea that you will find later on page 45 that there are kinds of sickness that are easy to cure at the beginning, but they're not identified in time. They're not diagnosed in time. They're diagnosed when the symptoms are very evident, but at that point they're difficult to cure, easy to diagnose, difficult to cure. So the timing of your intervention is critical, 
because the context is an ecosystem. It's an active process or the sum of several active processes. And so the moment where you apply your strategy will be key to success or the opposite. And very interesting, very Machiavellian, this kind of duplicitous attitude. And keep in mind this example because you will find it uh, implemented beautifully by Cesare Borgia in chapter seven. The idea that you're the conqueror, you're the oppressor, you just conquered a state, you've just brought the military there to offend people directly or indirectly, directly because they executed your orders, indirectly because you cannot control thousands of soldiers. But then, since you're there, you can be seen as a good paternal leader because you're there and the citizens who've been offended by you or by your soldiers can come to you and you can say, oh, it wasn't my fault. It was the fault of the soldiers. I will intervene. I will rectify this. And, and so you gain from using force, right, to establish control, and you gain influence by being seen as the savior of those that you have offended, okay? Which is something that we will see with Cesare Borgia, something that is often seen in situation where criminal organization operates, right? Because after all, the racket of criminal organizations is protection, right? But protection from what, really? Yes, uh, the mafia might guarantee a shopkeeper that they will not be uh, bothered by other mafia groups or that they will not suffer robberies from local criminals who will be afraid to go against the mafia. But, but then, basically, you're paying for protection from the very people who uh, are extorting you. And there are situations, and we have plenty of anecdotal evidence and documents from trials, that once in a while, you will be robbed. Uh, and, and then you have to accept that because the person who robbed you is themselves protected by the mafia organization. We have an example from the 19th century, which is very interesting in Italy, someone in Naples who's under the protection of the Camorra who says, I sell horses and I pay to have this protection so that no one will give me a horse that is sick because I'm protected by, by these guys. So if they're trying to sell me the lemon equivalent of a bad horse, then I have recourse not to justice because the local government doesn't intervene, but to this uh, mafia leader, right? But sometimes they will sell me a bad horse and I have to pay and not say anything, okay? And, and again, there are plenty of examples. Frank Sinatra was protected by the mafia, yeah. right? At the same time, sometimes they would say, come here and uh, similarly to what Johnny Fontaine was told, come here and do a concert in Las Vegas, five concerts in Las Vegas for us for free. And he had to, and he did. Okay. Um, so, and, and this passage, recognize this passage. This is, was incorporated in the dialogue from the Bronx Tale that we saw, we watched the movie that we watched on, uh, on a Friday at the beginning of the semester, right? Where uh, Chas Palminteri, the character played by Chas Palminteri, repeats more or less the same thing that he wants to be seen in the neighborhood. If they wish to be good, they have more reason to love me. If they wish to be otherwise, they have more reason to fear me. That's what he says. And it's a paraphrase from the uh, prince. And then you have, you see the effect, you see how influence can become deterrence, right? Because at that point, once you've solidified control and you've gained support, duplicitously, in a deceiving way, but you've gained support uh, of the locals, then if any enemy wishes to attack your state, he is more hesitant because they see not only the kind of force you have, your army, but they see the kind of favor you have, the kind of support you have from the locals. And again, it's easy to see that the Russians expected to have more support. They thought that the Ukrainians and other ethnic groups within that state 
would not be supportive of the government of Zelensky as much as they did. Um, the other remedy to gain control is to send colonies. In, the, in this example, Machiavelli, even though he's not uh, quoting Roman history, is referring to something that the Romans did a lot. By the beginning of the empire, the uh, system in place within the Roman army was the following. If you served for at least 20 years and you survived, which was not impossible because the Romans were careful. Compared to any other military organization, they knew that their resources were precious and they never engaged the enemy if, whenever they knew that they could win but suffer too many losses. To the point where you find incredible examples, so extraordinary, so odd, that even St. Augustine will mention some of those examples in the City of God, talking to the Christians saying, you think the Romans, because they were pagans, were worse than you? They were better than you. And he, and he goes into examples where, for example, a Roman officer engages in a skirmish at the border with barbarians and has a victory, and then he is jailed or executed. Even though he was the hero, because he acted without explicit orders from the hierarchy of the military, exposing their soldiers to unnecessary losses. Yes, Christine? You know, another example from that era is, I mean, from Pontius Pilate, the biblical character who was, I mean, doesn't really, like, not a slang that's not talked about in the Bible, but historically, he just famously slaughtered a bunch of Sumerians and to the point where even Rome went, like, Okay, you're too violent for us. We're removing you from your post. You're out of here. Interesting. Yes, no, I wasn't familiar with that, with those actions by Pontius Pilate, so but yes, absolutely. So, after 20 years of, or, or more of service, the soldiers would receive a plot of land because the, the dream for, for, for every Roman, their culture was very traditional. Their dream was to have a peaceful life in the countryside as a farmer. Work outside, reap the benefits of the land, have fresh produce, etc. That was my father's dream. He worked 48 years in a state office. But his dream was, I'll retire and I'll buy a house in the countryside and have a, a small field to work. And of course, he never did. But he grew up with that kind of mentality. But, however, then, you find, for example, in a famous page in Tacitus, the military, the soldiers complaining, well, yes, they gave me a field, but this field was in Romania. And of course, and, and this field is a marsh, it, the, 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 the soil is terrible, etc. And, and the crops are not that good. Why Romania or other places in Eastern Europe because those were places near the borders where attacks would come. So Romans were essentially creating a reserve of trained veterans. They, they could rearm and send to the front lines at a moment's notice. So that was the correct use of colonies that Machiavelli has in mind. You establish a small number of local, friendly local communities whose interests are guaranteed by you, and so they will take the arms if the locals uh, start a rebellion, because otherwise they will lose everything. And again, this was repeated during the age of colonialism. And look at what Machiavelli says, though. You cannot do willy-nilly. You can have as many colonies as you want to, because otherwise you will lose influence. You have the force to take the land. And again, going back to the example of the Romans, the Romans, whenever they conquered a territory during the last period of the Republic, they went through a, a, a series of negotiations and rituals that established that everything in the conquered land, the soil, the people, the animals, belonged to the Roman state. Then they would generously give back most of it to the people, but they would keep slaves, right? They would enslave part of the population. They would keep a portion of the animals and a portion of the land. 
which approximately we can quantify at around 20%, okay? So say Machiavelli says, you could conquer everything and keep everything, but then you have no influence because you've offended everyone. So you offend a small number of people and the majority of people will just go along because what are they going to do? Turn from peaceful citizens into rebels? Not unless they think that their properties and their lives are endangered, are being threatened. But otherwise, if they see that your actions are limited to a small territory, to a small number of locals, then they will go along with you because after all, you're so powerful. Which is interesting in terms of saying force has limits. Because if you resort to an excessive use of force, you lose influence and force without influence cannot be efficiently uh, used. Once you establish your power, then you have deterrence, right? You become the leader and defender of the neighbors outside the state, the smaller city-states outside of the region you control, and then you have a buffer zone, right? If your enemy tries to attack, you have friendly states around you that will offer some resistance, okay? Which is what NATO is trying to do, right? Why don't we have Ukraine as a nice buffer between us and Russia? Because if they want to attack Europe, they'll have to deal with an ally that is there. The same reason why they brought Poland or Hungary or the Czech Republic into NATO, the, the former communist country, so that they have a buffer between Russia and the areas they really care for, which is Germany. They don't care about Poland if it is invaded, really. Um, and again, you see this, this alignment of the people as a result of well-deployed force, limited use of force, and force in combination with influence. You try to boost your influence so that people comply with rules because most people are gregarious in nature. Chapters four and five, I only selected a few passages, so we'll go through them quickly. Chapter four basically tells you that there are two kinds of structural organizations for the administration of power in a state. You can place every citizen at the same level. And in some states from the past, it means everyone was like a slave. Everyone lost their powers and rights entirely. And then you place ministers above them. That is to say, you nominate people who represent the central government and respond to the central government. More importantly, in Machiavelli's mind is the fact that ministers do not have the right to transmit their power to their sons, right? It's not a transmissible power, cannot be inherited. If a minister dies, it is the central government who will appoint the next minister, the next local leader. And this seems to be the way to go according to Machiavelli because the other system is the system of feudalism. That is to say, you divide the new state, the new regions, you assign aristocrats in charge of them, barons is just a name that encompasses all the various hierarchical uh, labels, the dukes, the counts, the marquis, etc. But the problem with those barons is that they have power that can be inherited by their family so they gain too much influence over the local areas because they are the authority. And they can resist change from the central government. It's much, difficult, much more difficult to replace a baron than it is to replace a minister. For a minister, all you have to do is write a letter of appointment and send someone with that letter to that particular area. With a baron, well, if they resist, you have to fight them militarily. So it's easier because the, why would this be part of the equation? Because in this case, you don't commit any resources. You just say to someone, you're in charge of this area. Whatever you need, you take from the area. So you need to pay your soldiers. You impose taxes, but that's your business, right? Uh, you ensure that justice is administered correctly. I don't want to hear complaints from 
the citizens there, etc. So feudal system is always the, the preference of governments that have, don't have the resources to create an administrative infra infrastructure. In the case of the ministers, the minister will be asking you for the resources to take care of their territory. And finally, chapter five, where we find again the same kind of language of brutal, pragmatic language that is so innovative in Machiavelli. So let's, what is the context? Again, there is a context for this chapter. States that are acquired, so they're new territories, and where the citizens are accustomed to live with their own laws and liberty. So this is their habitual mind, mindset. Liberty and laws. Again, liberty doesn't mean that there is freedom anywhere in society during Machiavelli's time other than for the top echelon of society, right? So don't, don't extend these terms and superimpose our idea of freedom and liberty to these times. It's still, even when you find the democratic organization, is still uh, the democracy of, of the one percenters, right? Or two percenters at best. And uh, so, how do you deal with this kind of context? First thing, destroy them. <laughs> use force. But what else can you do? They're accustomed to liberty, so use force as much as possible because there is no more secure manner for possessing them. And again, Machiavelli, what is new is that Machiavelli doesn't feel obliged to enter in, into any kind of philosophical debate about this terrible recommendation, right? This is bloodshed, this is massacre that is recommended and says, that's it. This is what the context requires. That is the and he would call that virtue, right? Because that is what the kind of skill and strategy that is required by the context. Second remedy, go there in person to live, because again, you affect the whole ecosystem with your presence, because you, have, you naturally have influence. You already have troops there, but you add influence if you go there in person. And then, otherwise, what do you do? Allow them to live with their own laws. So don't change their habits, because if they, you change their habits, that will resist more. So you just impose tributes, meaning give me money every year, and you rely on a local group of oligarchs, meaning the 1% of the 1%. You have a group with wealth and political influence who will take your side, whose interests will rely on that, and I bet that this is the kind of plan that Putin has in mind right? Well, not so much have them live with their own laws, but certainly establish an oligarchy the same way that happened with the Soviet Union, where about three million people were part of the nomenclature, part of the state machine, machinery, and they had a vested interest in uh, um, ensuring the continuation of the status quo, right? So I'm sure that Putin doesn't believe that he can gain any real influence and support with the Ukrainians, but that he could rely on a small group of people who could become very rich, the same way that some Russians, after the fall of communists, became billionaires, the various Abramovich, the owner of Chelsea, and others, and therefore became supporters, direct and indirect supporters of the government. So, I've completed these chapters, so I will continue with six and seven uh, at a later time.